So Sand and Stars is based on the story of a man named Abram who was living with a God-inspired dream in his heart. And his dream was that he would have a family that would become a great tribe of people, so large in number that they would be like the sand on the beach and the stars in the sky. So throughout Abram's life, it seemed impossible that this would actually happen. His wife was barren. There were a lot of realistic negatives that would hold him back from, you know, he was old when he started down this pathway of dreaming, but, but he kept hope alive. And, and the, the, the Scripture says that, who, that, that he had hope against all hope. In other words, he had hope when he didn't really have a reason to have hope. So we look at him as a model here of a man who held on to a vision and a dream and a hope in his life. And Abram's not the only one who God, who has God-inspired dreams. Each of us are created to see things that we don't see, to imagine things that don't yet exist, and to partner with God in the creative process until those dreams become a reality. It's very easy to get sidetracked, to get distracted, to get stuck, and to miss out on the future that God has for you. And so we're going to continue today to look at the life of Abram, for for direction in our own lives, for encouragement in our own lives, in our own pursuit of sand and stars. I want to begin in Genesis chapter 11 with a story, and we're going to use this story in Abram's life to learn from today. Genesis 11, verse 27, here's how it reads. It says, this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father, notice this, of Abram. So now we're introduced to his father by name. Abram's father by name is Terah. And, and it says that he, Abram had two brothers here, Naor and Haran. Verse 28, while his father Terah was still alive, Haran died. It's an important part of our message today. Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Sons are not supposed to die before fathers. And I think all of us, even though most of us have not experienced that, would agree that would be a a horrific experience. It's just not the way we expect life to go. Sons bury fathers, not fathers bury sons. Verse 31, Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, the wife of his son Abram. So he takes his family, a small group of them, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Everybody shout Canaan. They are they're headed for Canaan, and Canaan in the Bible is the land of promise. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. When they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died. And you could say here, he died where he settled. He died in Haran. Now now backtrack with me. When Terah left Ur, he was headed to Canaan, to the land of promise. But he settled in Haran. Now we don't know for sure why Terah settled in Haran, but it's very possible and very likely, and most theologians and Bible people would agree 
that the town that he settled in had the same name as his son that had died. And so when he got to Haran, the, the, the town named Haran, that he lingered there and he perhaps thought, I'll just hang out here a little while. Like there, there was some sort of maybe sentimental attachment. And he thinks to himself, just a few days here. Remembering his son, a memorial for his son. But a few days turn into a, a few months. And a few months turn into a few years. And a decision that seemed really harmless ends up holding Tara, Tara in, in a place that he was not meant to be in. The first thing, if you're taking notes, that I want you to write down is that memories have to be managed. When you're going to sand and stars, when you're going after your dreams, your visions, and your hope, remember this, memories have to be managed. Memories have to be managed. If you're going to get to the land of sand and stars, memories have to be managed. We all have painful memories, and there's emotions that are attached to those memories. A couple of weeks ago, Sheila made a, our, our family had had a busy day, and we often don't eat together, all of us, but uh, that evening it just seemed like the right thing to do. If you know my wife, she's spontaneous, and she can do, she can multitask, like she's ADD, and she got to do this and do that. She can, she's amazing in, in that way. Like, we, now I said ADD, and some of you are like, that, you shouldn't tell that about your wife. No, no, we, we, uh, we applaud her for that. <laughs> like, some, in some ways it's a gift, okay? And so, so, so she's multitasking. One of the things she starts doing is cooking dinner for everybody. Because it's late in the day, and oh my goodness, we're hungry, got to eat. And so she made a quick dinner, chicken and pasta. And, and she also is thinking of everyone in the family, because um, some people, when it's pasta in our family, they want gluten-free. And, and some people want wheat. And, and, and the boys like their own kind of pasta. And, and, and so there's different kinds of pasta, and she's got it all going on the, on the, on the stove and in the oven, and she's going to town. And, and, and I get my plate of pasta, and I'm really hungry, and I, and I take a few bites, and I realize that it's undercooked a little bit. And, and it's chewy, and, uh, and, and so I made a decision in the moment that I'm not going to say anything. This is one of the, the things you can do to make your marriage last a long time. <laughs> I, I just like, you know, that you got to pick your battles. And I'm like, this isn't, this isn't a battle I need, to, I need to fight right now. And besides, I'm really hungry and I am scarfing that stuff down and I'm chewing it and I'm chewing it and I'm smiling and I'm not saying a word. And, and a few hours later, my body was violently rejecting the presence of that food in my system. So, I don't mean just like nausea. I'm talking violent. <laughs> can, you, can you relate? I don't want to get any more graphic. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about today? I'm talking midnight, call 911. <laughs> I, I, I'm, talking, I'm talking hospital. I'm talking IV. I'm talking Pastor Kevin going to heaven prematurely. <laughs> Somebody do something. Oh, man, it was, it was horrible. And so for days, the mention of food created flashbacks. And, and then if you... Like, like what I found out, by the way, is we all had the same chicken, but we all had different pasta. And you may not know, I'm here to help you today. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to make your life better. Pasta can have bacteria, and you can get really bad food poisoning from pasta. Google it. Check it out. Make sure you get it right. Okay, so, <laughs> hey, you're welcome. Uh, so, so, um, 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 
realizing I don't even like right now talking about pasta because there's an emotion that gets triggered with the memory. And, and, and I want to just say to you that that's how memories are. And, and it can be a song that comes on the radio that triggers an emotion connected to a memory. It can be running into a person with whom you've had a past relationship and just you see their face and all of a sudden a good day goes bad. It triggers an emotion inside of you and takes you away from the present and puts you in an emotionally charged experience of the past. It can cause you to feel angry with yourself or with someone else. It can cause you to, to, to just feel bad about something that is way back there in your past and to regret something that you cannot change. You can, you can feel bitterness and pain from the loss of people and opportunities in your past. For many people, it's the bad relationship experience that now is a barrier to you having a good relationship with the people God is putting in your life. Because just the whole idea of getting close to someone and trusting someone, it triggers an emotion of fear and you pull back. And I'm talking to people, I'm talking about sand and stars. I'm talking about what you're praying for in your life, what you're hoping for, what you're imagining. I'm talking about your future, and I'm saying to you that don't underestimate the power of the memories. You gotta manage your memories. This is really powerful stuff. You're not gonna get where God wants you to go if you don't manage your memories. Some people, because of this dynamic, they, they medicate. They got memories that create emotions and they medicate, they get in alcohol, they, they rely on drugs to take them away from the emotional dynamic of, of memories they regret, mistakes that they've made, things that have happened, sorrow in their life, breakups, mess ups, goof ups. And, they, and, then, and then by medicating and the abuse of, of, of drugs or alcohol, they end up creating more bad memories in their life and the cycle continues sabotaging sand and stars. The Apostle Paul urged us to move our lives forward and, and he said it like this, and, and, and it's really clear. He said, one thing I do, one thing I do. Everybody say one thing. Come on, say one thing. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Manage your memory. Manage your memory. Manage, you cannot take a walk down memory lane and get to sand and stars. Manage, there's some things you're supposed to remember and there's other things you're supposed to forget. There's some things you cannot just be calling back into your mind. It triggers something inside of you and, it, and you get stuck. And, and, and the Apostle Paul said, I strain towards what is ahead. That's a pretty powerful verbiage and word picture like I press. I pressed on to the goal to win the prize for which God's called me heavenward. I'm not there yet. I haven't attained everything, but I strain and I press and I forget. Why does he put such emphasis on this if it's not important? Do, do you hear me today? And boy, I feel like this weekend I'm, I'm talking, I just feel like I'm talking to some people this weekend that you continue, to, you continue to curse it and nurse it and rehearse it and hash over it and you were born in this situation. You had, a, lot of, a lot of people do this today. Like they want to go back and change history. You can't change history. You can't change the past. You can only do something about the future. And, and if you dwell on the past, you're never going to get to your future. Is there anybody receiving what I'm saying? Come on. You, you gotta manage your memory. You gotta manage your memory. You gotta manage your memory. The second thing is never settle. Never settle. Dreamers don't settle. Dreamers pioneer. 
I said, dreamers pioneer. Dreamers are not intimidated by going where they haven't gone before. They pioneer. Yeah, you can feel the fear, but dreamers do it anyway. You might be scared, but dreamers say, hey, let's go. Dreamers push past the comfort zone. Dreamers don't settle. Dreamers don't settle. Tara settled in Haran. Tara settled in Haran. And here's where we introduce the star of our story, Tara's son Abram settled with his father. Where's Abram? He's in Haran. Where was Abram supposed to go? Canaan. Listen listen to me today. If you hang out with settlers, you're going to settle. No, 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 Pastor Kevin, they they, they don't affect me. I I do my thing. If you hang out with settlers, you're going to settle. You adapt to the conditions. You take on the mindset of a settler. You adopt the reasoning of a settler, the conversation of a settler. Sand and stars people are not settlers. We don't think like settlers, and we don't talk like settlers. I was asked by a person, this has been a while back, but a person said, when is the church big enough for you? (laughs) And I was caught off guard a little bit, and I, 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 wow, like, like, well, I, I, I guess when everyone in the city is safe and in a church. And as long as there's people in our city who don't know Jesus, the church is not big enough. Just want to give you a cue, 1130, when I said that in the other services this weekend, everybody like clapped and cheered. And... <laughs> It's a little cue. Right now I'm liking those other services better than I'm liking you. (laughs) And by the way, don't miss next weekend because next week I'll be making an exciting announcement. I'm going to be sharing our our vision for our church's future next week. Look at somebody say, don't miss, don't miss, don't miss. You got to be here. Change your plans. Yeah, get some clapping going like change your plans next week. Really, really, I'm really pumped. I'm really excited. I'm going to be sharing some, some really specific clarity announcement vision next week. Dreamers don't settle. Dreamers and settlers just think differently. Like, I, I know what that person was thinking when they asked me the question. They didn't know what I was thinking, which is why they asked the question. But when they asked me, I knew how a settler thinks. A settler thinks like, like, it's like bigger than most churches. It's like we've added services, like we, and parking lots can get really busy. And there's more people than I can actually know, Pastor Kevin. And there's more people than you can actually know. Like, when is it big enough? But a dreamer's like, yay, busy parking lots. Yay, we got to have more services. Yay, that's awesome. People I don't know that Jesus knows. Yay. Like totally different. 
Come on, go, go ahead. There you go, 11.30. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> Genesis 12. I'm going to keep moving here. Genesis 12, the Lord. So remember, he's, he's in. He settled with his father, right? So now Genesis 12, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country. So Terah dies. Dad's died. God says to Abram, hey, you, the one who's been stuck. The sand and stars guy, remember? We're going somewhere, right? I got, I'm gonna talk to you about something, but I need you to leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. See, God knew that Abram needed to leave some people and some relationship and some mindset to get into the position to experience sand and stars in his life. And God will do the same for every person in pursuit of sand and stars in your life. He will do the same thing. He, he, will, he will remind you, hey, you can't keep doing what you're doing, saying what you're saying, thinking what you're thinking, and expect to experience the promises that I have for your future. You can't do that. You won't get there like that. That same attitude you've always had, time to leave it. The same mindset, like, like, I know, I know, you grew up in that family, and, and you've said it for years, like, it's my dad, like, we're German, we're Italian, like, we just get mad really fast, like, and, and God's saying, time for you to leave your excuses. Yeah, that's good. Time for you to get rid of the negativity. Yeah. Like, you, yeah, you grew up in a house of complainers, and now you don't even realize it, but I'm showing you, you are a complainer, and I, I need you to quit complaining and start complimenting. And if you'll leave your complaining. And you know what's funny about that? I just got to throw this in there. Sometimes you really have to learn new verbiage and new language. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about Spanish or I'm just talking about a lot of people are real adept with negativity, complaining. It's how they grow up. They think everybody talks that way. And then God will come along in your life when you say, God, I want your best for my life. God, I want everything you got for me. God, I, I want my children to grow up loving you, honoring you. God will start to show you what you got to leave. He'll show you today there's friends in your life. Listen up, young adults. Listen up, high schoolers. He'll show you like it ain't getting you where you want to go. You're hanging around with those guys, those gals, that lifestyle, those people like they ain't going where you're going. Leave them. Yeah. Ah, that's my friend since grade school. Ah, leave them. You got to leave them if you're going to get where God wants you to go. You mean just leave my friend? That's my friend. Yeah, leave your <laughs> friend. Oh, man, I'm doing better than you are right now. Like, I'm... We get, we get stuck, don't we, in lots of scenarios. We stuck, people get stuck in disappointment. And uh, disappointment is something we all feel and we all have. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Life has, is full of disappointment. But disappointment is not supposed to dictate your destiny. So, so, so it's okay to be disappointed, but make sure you pass through disappointment. Yeah. That's good. Make sure you don't linger there. Talk about it, dwell on it. Well, the reason I don't get involved and I don't go to growth track, I had this bad church experience and really disappointed, some people disappointed me and okay. So how long are you gonna live there? <laughs> how long are you gonna stay there? Well, I'm actually, Pastor Kevin, for me, it's not people, it's God. I'm disappointed. Like, I, I'm disappointed in God. Like, I prayed for that, and it didn't happen. And I thought God would do what I wanted, and I asked. And he, God did not come through. I'm, I'm just disappointed, okay? You're allowed to be disappointed. How long are you going to stay there? Yeah. How long are you going to stay there? Really? Is that really where you want to live? Is that really where you want to spend the rest of your life? In disappointment. 
You really want to stay in a place of regret. For some people, it's like what God will say to you on your way to sand and stars is he'll say, I need you to think bigger. Yeah. And that's the third thing I want to talk about here. The third thing is keep vision in front of you. God did that for Abram. He said to Abram, hey, leave your country, leave your, your family, leave your relationships, because verse 2, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. Come on. I will make you. I'm going to bless you, and you're going to be a blessing. How many of you know we walk by faith, not by sight? Come on, that's who we are as Christ followers. We walk by faith and not by sight. So the Lord knew that Abram was stuck in the tendency and thinking of his father, and he needed a fresh vision for the future. And I want to, I want to, you know, one of the things that bothers me a lot is that, and I'm speaking to us as a whole today and as God's people today, is that sometimes Nike has more vision for our future and our children than we do. (laughs) They already got picked out what our kids are going to wear. They've got the imagery that is attracting children into that tennis shoe, that style, that future. They got it down. They're going. They're going. They're going. The next place, they got it picked out. And, and what society does is they just follow, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes Apple, the, the new iPhone was just released on Friday, and I was walking by, and I saw this huge line, like, like ways. And I'm like, where are all these people? Wait, well, the i10 I iPhone, I think you call it. The, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It just, you say so. Uh, it just came out, like. People waiting in line. And so I'm saying as God's church, I I feel like we need to be, we need to have the biggest vision of everybody on the planet. Like, I feel like we we are the ones who ought to be faith-filled, like thinking about the future. And and because we know that the Bible says without a vision, people perish. We know that it's dream or die, dream or die, dream or die. Dream or die. That, that's vision perish. Dream or die. So of all, God, all the people on the planet that ought to know about stirring up the vision, think about the future, have some hope in your heart, don't let go of your hope, keep sand and stars out in front of you. Of all of the people on the planet, it ought to be us. It ought to be us. Thinking about the future. And I want to tell you, if you love our church, you love who we are, where we are, what we've done, uh, uh, thank you very much, but we're not done yet. Join us. Come along with us. This annual offering that we have let, called Legacy Offering that's coming up in a couple of weeks, it, it's, it's, let me tell you, it's a vision offering. And this year, we're, we're still dreaming. We're dreaming about, especially dreaming about expanding our church into communities around the Seattle region. So if you can imagine Champion Centers in places like Auburn and places like Bonnie Lake, like could you imagine Champion Centers going to Gig Harbor and DuPont and Olympia and Seattle and all over, like could you, if you can imagine that concept, come along with us because we, 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 we believe that we are destined to go into places we haven't been, and to do things that we haven't done, and also believe that when we honor God's house, God honors our house, and when we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that all the things we need are going to be added to us. Jesus said that. So, we're saying to everyone, hey, we changed the date this year to disrupt the routine. Let's not be robotic. Let's all seek God. Let's pray earnestly. Let's prepare diligently. Let's give extravagantly from a place of vision to see our church expand in this region. Let's pioneer. Come on, let's pioneer. 
Everybody say, we're not settlers. Come on, say, we're not settlers. If you want to go to a settling church, go to another church. We're not settlers. We are pioneers. We are envisioning taking everything God's given us and giving it back to Him and using it for His glory to expand into other places. Come on. What if we started adding one or two campuses a year? What, what if we started like eight? What would happen like eight to ten years from now? If, and, and, and what if our giving, not only our church, but what if our giving, because we're in the best position. I shouldn't say the best. Let me rephrase that. There's no one in a better position than Champion Center to really make a mark, like really, really charge the gates of hell in the Northwest. There's no one in a better position, no one poised, no one poised in a better place, guys, than we are. I'm talking to our church family right now. And, and, and what if we, what if we as an experienced, mature, older church who's been through a lot to get where we are, what if we got young at heart again? What if we got a little bit like crazy in this, like, like we would if, if our children didn't have a classroom? or we didn't have seats to sit in, and we were a young church who wanted a building and a location. What if we got wild again? And we said, well, we got it, but we're gonna make sure somebody else has it. And we're gonna put buildings there, and seats there, and classrooms there. Wow. Okay, I wanna say something. I wanna say something uh, this weekend, everybody's a part of it. And I'm, I'm gonna like narrow this down. I want everybody to just do your best. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Do your very best, do everything you can. Go the extra mile, think, pray, get creative. Ask God to give you an idea. How can I do this, God? How can I give above and beyond? What can I do really, really special that's really big for me? I wanna be big thinking, I wanna have vision. Get the vision in front of us. And let's think about how we could really impact together, the great Northwest, okay? We're not comfortable, we're not subtle. Comfortable is way overrated. Right? Yeah. Ask any pregnant mom if she's comfortable and she will slap you. <laughs> but ask her if she really wants that baby and she will say, absolutely. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Comfortable is way overrated. Yeah. Yeah. We're here to make a difference. We're here to be salt and light. We're here to dream about things that are not as though they were. We're here to have a vision. We're here to believe God for the great Northwest. And what if our dreaming then inspired other churches? What if our giving inspired other churches? What if churches all around the great Northwest in Oregon and Washington and said, why not us? Like Champion Center did this, we can do that too. We can grow, we can exceed the boundaries of normal. We can do something big for God in our generation. So, so okay, now I'm going to narrow this down. I'm almost done, but don't dare leave. Don't leave until we're completely over today, by the way, because some great things happen in the last moments of, uh, of our services. So stay here, stay plugged in, hear me out, and let's stay connected in the last few moments here. But I want to say something. I've never done this before, I don't think, but I want to talk to maybe a couple of you. I don't know how many of you there might be that would fit this category, but whenever we come to a time of giving like this, there is people who have very little who are gonna, like, they're gonna go past normality. They're gonna get creative and they're gonna give what is to them a big, big amount and offering to the house of God. But I wanna say to some of you that have more, I'm gonna ask you to give more. I'm, I'm gonna ask you, some of you who have said, I wanna give big amounts to, to the house of God, uh, I, I want to do something significant before I die or my pastor dies of, of, of food poisoning uh, and pasta. Uh, I, I want to do uh, something big. I want us to get there. I want us in the next few years like to have this dream come true. And, and you have large amounts. You have, I, I just should say significant. You might not even think it's big, but com compared to others, you've got a way to give something significant. And, and I wanna put my application in because I feel like myself, our team, our church family, Champion Center, heart and soul is, should be considered, we are a candidate for your best offering 
to the kingdom of God. That offering may be that once in a lifetime amount, like that big amount that you think, well, nobody else has given that in our church. People with less cannot give like people with more. People with more should not give like people with less. My wife and I, a week ago, pulled envelopes off the board. The envelopes are coming down. The envelopes represent, there's 1,500 envelopes with dollar amounts on them in our lobbies at our locations, and they represent our vision for our house this year. Our, our envelopes are down. Our family's envelopes are down. What about you? People are walking by with taking envelopes. What, 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 what about you? And is it possible that you're here today and you could take a whole lot of those envelopes down? And what I'm saying to you is that our, our church is strong. Our church is credible. Our church is poised to do some serious damage to the darkness. And in every one of us is a giver. Now, now, a lot of times the giver in us gets covered up with fear. The giver in us gets buried in greed. The giver in us has to deal with a lot of mind mind. But in every single one of us, there is a giver. We're created in the image of God, and God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And there's a giver in every single one of us. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to perhaps just one, maybe two, somebody who... And I hope all the rest of you, I'm, I'm not talking to keep you comfortable. I'm talking to you because this is an appeal on behalf of heaven today. And, and we've been here long enough to gain experience as a church family, as a leadership team. And we're not perfect, but we are, we are, we are seasoned, but we're still young, we're still fresh, we're still feisty, we're still faith-filled, we're still big thinking, and we know exactly what to do. We know exactly what to do with resources if they come into our hands. So will you pray about it? I don't mean just like, put, will you honestly pray? And this goes for everyone now. Will you honestly ask God, God, what would you have me to do? Because God, I gotta leave, I gotta leave where I've been. And I gotta go where you want me to go. And the last point of my message is worded like this. Keep making bold moves in the right direction. Keep making bold. Everybody shout bold. bold. Come on, say bold. bold. God doesn't stir us to small ambitions. They're always big and bold. And when God said to Abram, leave, Abram gathered family together, and he went, and he ended up, he ended up in the land of promise. He ended up in sand and stars. He ended up, come on, in the place of God's will for his life. Okay. I, I love you today. I'm so thankful that you're a part of our family in one way or another. And if you're a guest with us or you're a normal, regular part, I don't know if normal is the right word. I, I just, I'm so thankful for our church family. And I believe God's called us to do greater and bigger things. And, and I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to go home and I'm going to be at peace today. I talked to you very openly. I got over people who when you talk about money, they criticize you, I'm over that, done, not worried about it. They go, to, they go to ball games and they pay big prices for tickets and they don't say a word and they go on their deal and do their deal and whatever they like and they don't say a word and, 
and, and I'm here front and center, and, and I don't really give a care because I know that, that the most important thing on the planet is the work of God. Nothing compares, nothing compares. And God deserves our very best. God deserves our very, very, very best. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big hand. Let's give him a great big thank you for all he is and all he's been and all he's done in our lives today, amen? Wow. While you remain standing, I want to invite people today at all of our locations, I want to invite you. If you're here today and you're not in right standing with God, your big bold move is this move. Your big bold move in the right direction is to surrender your life and your future to Jesus Christ. To invite Him to be the leader and the Lord of your life to trust him his ways are not our ways but to trust him that he is your redeemer you might feel unqualified he qualifies you and to put your confidence in him not what people say but put your trust in him not just for the best life possible this side of eternity, which is what you'll have, but also for a never-ending, ongoing, eternal life. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Kevin, I don't want to leave here like I came. I want to leave here knowing that I'm forgiven, having a hope in my heart, knowing God has chosen me, forgiven me, loves me. I'm in the kingdom, I'm included. I want, a, I want a new life, Pastor Kevin. I want a new beginning. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed at our locations right now. People are thinking and praying and pondering and considering. And I want to invite you, whoever you are right now, come on, whoever you are, don't, don't put it off. Whoever you are, this is your moment. We've had so, lots of salvations this weekend already. But you know what? Your, yours matters. Your life matters. Your future matters. And if God's talking to you today, will you surrender? Will you say yes? If so, I'm going to ask you to begin right now, wherever you are, as I talk still, to raise a hand. You can raise your right hand. You can raise your left. You can raise both. I want to invite you to raise a hand and to say, count me in, God. I, I, want, I want a new beginning. I know, God, that you think of me as your child, but today I begin to know I'm fully accepted, I'm fully embraced, I belong in your family. Good hands are going up, hands are going up. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, God bless you. Wow, I see hands going up all around the auditorium. Fantastic, hold your hands up high, wherever you are, hold them up high. We're all gonna say this together. Say, Lord Jesus, welcome to my world. I invite you today, come into my heart, my life, forgive me of all my sin and make me a new person. My hope is in you. In Jesus' name. I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name. And all God's people shout a big. Amen. Welcome to the family of God. Everybody who raised your hands, come on, we welcome you. Let's celebrate church, celebrate new beginnings.